Good evening again, it's good to be with you. Uh, Let's bow for a wee word of prayer before we turn to God's word for our evening meeting this evening. Let's pray. Our loving Father, we thank you for the tremendous privilege we have of being able to draw aside into your presence. Lord, we thank you that one day the veil was rent in two that we could enter into the Holy of Holies, that we could stand in the holy place. And Lord, we thank you this evening that we don't come, Lord, through any merits of our own, but we thank you we come in and through the name that is above every name, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We praise you again for the Lord Jesus Christ tonight. We thank you for his great love toward us and that while we were yet sinners that he died for us on the cross we thank you that god loved the world so much that he didn't spare his best but he freely gave us all in sending his only son into this world to go all the way to the cross and to bear our sin and sorrow and make them his very own and to bear our burden to calvary and to suffer and die alone Thank you for that once for all sacrifice for sin forever. Thank you that the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross cried, it is finished. Thank you that salvation's plan has been accomplished. And we thank you, Lord, that all we need to do is come by faith, repenting of sin, to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and be sure that heaven is our eternal home. And Father, we thank you for your word tonight again. We thank you that your word is a living word. And thank you, Lord, that it is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We thank you that the entrance of your word brings light. And Father, we pray as we read your word just now, as we share some thoughts together this evening, the Lord, that you will bless your word to all of our hearts and our God, that you will use it for the extension of your kingdom. And Lord, we do pray especially if there should be someone listening tonight who doesn't know Christ in a personal way, that Lord, you'll help them to understand their need of a savior tonight, to understand their need a Lord of, of one who stands with open arms, willing and able to change their lives for time and for eternity. Bless us, Lord, we pray. Again, Lord, we, we pray for each person who's listening tonight. Lord, you know every heart and every need and every individual. And Lord, we just pray that you'll minister to hearts and that you'll meet needs. And Lord, we do pray especially for the Thompson family tonight. We thank you, Lord, for Ethel. We thank you for her life. We thank you for her testimony her love for the Saviour. And Lord, we thank you that today that she's absent from the body, but we praise you that she's present with the one who she loved and served for so many years. We pray, Lord, for her family today. We ask, Lord, that you'll be with them. Lord, that they will know your help, that they will know your strength, that they will know your comfort, Lord. Thank you that you promise in your word that you are a refuge and our our strength, a, a very present help in days of trouble. And then, Lord, this family needs you tonight and our god we just ask that you will just wrap them around with your love again this evening with your care and with your comfort we pray for ross and lee and kelly and gareth and lord the whole family circle the grandchildren the great grandchildren that lord you'll be with each one of them and lord may they know your help in these days ahead we pray we just thank you again lord that you're a god who knows us and a god who understands us and lord we thank you we can cast our care on you because you care for us. Bless us now, Lord, as we share some thoughts together, we come around your word. Just bless us together, we pray. In Jesus' precious and worthy name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Now, if you want to get your Bible, we're going to read together from Luke chapter 23 and commencing together to read at verse 32. Luke chapter 23, commencing together to read at verse 32 of the chapter, please. Verse 32, and there were also two other malefactors led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself if he be Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew, This is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors which were hanged reeled at him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. 
But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. We'll end there at verse 46, and we know that God will bless the reading of his word to your hearts this evening. They tell us that a memory is a wonderful thing. What is a memory? Memory is to cast our mind back to another time, another place, another occasion. It's to look back and to reflect on the things that have happened to us. And I'm sure for all of us in life, we often look back and we reminisce and we remember many of the things that have happened to us. Maybe many of the places that we have been to. Now, I can remember my very first day at school. That's a long time ago. I remember being dragged into school by my mother. I went to school in Newry, down in County Down, and dragged into school by my mother. I remember her going out the door. I remember kicking the teacher. And I remember running back out the door and running down the steps of the school again to be brought back in again by my mother and left there in school. But I remember it very, very clearly, even as it was only a, a five-year-old, nearly 50 years ago. We remember many things in life, don't we? We look back and reflect over many things. Whenever we mention the year 2020, what do we all think about? We all think about COVID, don't we? Coronavirus. And that has left a very lasting impression on our lives, hasn't it? We remember birthdays. And if you're a husband, you better remember a birthday of your wife. We remember anniversaries. We remember deaths. There's so many things that we look back in our mind's eye and we reflect on through life. My very first mission with the Faith Mission was down outside Cookstown. And then I did another mission not very far away from that, my very first winter work mission. And there was a man who was a very renowned bachelor who was involved in that mission. He was the person who invited us to come to do the mission in Little Orange Hall. And there, um, every night, the man would be there. He was, he was so good to us, and he had us in his home for meals and so on and so on. But the last night of the mission, after three weeks, he got up and he was thanking us for coming to do the mission. And then as he got up, this renowned bachelor said, I remember my first kiss. Well, I tell you, everyone stopped and everyone listened that night. There was no one sleeping. A renowned bachelor in the area, he remembered his first kiss. And he said, yes, it was like a cow pulling his foot out of a shock. I hope you understand that here. A cow pulling his foot out of a shock. That was his remembrance of his first kiss. I don't know whether you remember your first kiss or not, but certainly there are many, many things in life that we look back and remember. And you know, tonight, just for a moment or two, I want us to look into the Word of God, which is so important to us. Look into the Word of God, and I want us to remember. And there are four things tonight that I want us to remember, or I believe that God wants us to remember through his word as we read it together. And the first one is a solemn reflection. It's found in Luke chapter 17 and verse 23, or 32. Luke chapter 17 and verse 32, and it's just three simple words. And it says there, remember Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. And there are some very solemn reasons why we should remember Lot's wife. The story of Lot and his wife is found in Genesis chapter 19. God had determined to destroy the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah for their wickedness. Again, Genesis 18 reminds us of that. And two angels warned Abraham's nephew Lot to get out of the cities so that he and his family would not be destroyed. Lot's wife was a very privileged woman because Lot's wife was the niece by marriage of Abraham. Uh, Abraham, a man who knew God, Abraham, a man who walked with God, a man who listened to God, a man who believed in God, a man who trusted in God. She was a very privileged woman. 
As I said, first of all, we read of her there in Genesis chapter 19. Lot might not have been all that he should have been, but he was a righteous man that vexed his soul with the filthy conversation of the Sodomites. Lot stands forth as a, a man of good intentions. Lot's wife was a privileged woman because she had a husband who also knew about God and knew God. He was a man who never planned to take his family into the wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. He just wanted to live in the vicinity. He wanted to take advantage of all the economic opportunities and the bustling trade that was there. Lot made some very wrong decisions in his life. One very big wrong decision was to pitch his tents towards Sodom, a wicked and a sinful city. The society there was shameless. Lot's wife not only moved into Sodom or the vicinity of Sodom, but Sodom moved into her. You see, the word of God reminds us that friendship with the world is enmity with God. And Lot's wife loved the world and the things that this world had to offer her. Her heart and her life was so bound by material things. All that she had in Sodom. She loved the world more than she loved God. Yet God in his mercy and his grace and his goodness warned Lot and warned his family, sent an angel by God to come and warn them to arise. He said to Lot, arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of this city. God was merciful to them. They were led outside the city. They were told to escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thee in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. As I said, Lot's wife was a very privileged woman. She heard the warning voice of God. She had opportunity to escape the judgment of God. And again, the word of God reminds us there, Genesis, God reigned upon Sodom and Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven, and he overthrew through those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. But then it goes on to tell us, but Lot's wife, his wife, looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. As I said, Lot's wife was a privileged woman. Lot's wife could see the influence of those that were godly who she knew. Lot's wife knew the warning of God. She had heard the warning of God. She partly believed the warning of God. Her body wasn't inside the city, but her heart was. And maybe for you this evening as you listen to this message, maybe this evening that's you. Maybe you've been brought up in the gospel. Maybe you've had a godly husband or wife. Maybe you've got a godly uh, uncle or aunt or, or grandparent or someone that has prayed for you down through the years, a godly mother and father. And you're a very privileged person. What a privilege it is that someone wants to pray for us and someone is concerned enough to pray for our soul. We're a privileged person. We're privileged people to be brought up here in the north of Ireland. Very privileged people. And certainly up here in County Antrim that is claimed as the Bible Belt of Northern Ireland. Very privileged people who have had the opportunities of hearing the gospel. Again, I said in past messages that, that there's about 7 billion people in the world. One third have heard the gospel. One third have opportunity of hearing the gospel. And one third have never heard. And is it fair that maybe you have heard the gospel many times and God has spoken to your heart many times and you've had many warnings from God many times. And still there's people who live across the world that have never heard once. Maybe you've been brought up under the gospel. Maybe you've been brought up in church as a child in Sunday school and you heard the gospel there. And still today you're outside of Christ. Lot's wife was someone who, in a moment of time, perished. She was only a few steps away from safety. They were going to the mountain in front of them, but she turned back, didn't she? You know, 
she partly believed the warning. She turned back and it tells us that she was turned into a pillar of salt. It tells us that she perished just a step away from safety. And there are many, many people who believe the gospel or partly believe the gospel. Many people who know their need of a saviour. Many people who know that the only way to heaven is through the Lord Jesus Christ and them coming by faith and trusting him as their saviour. And they partly believe that. And they'll say some other time in some other place, but not now. And one day, death will come suddenly and unannounced. And it's too late. And that's why the Lord Jesus said here, remember Lot's wife. Look back and reflect on this woman. This woman who loved the world more than she loved God. This woman who partly believed the warning from God. How many times has God warned you? How many meetings have you sat through? How many opportunities have people talking to you about the things of God? And you've heard that you need Christ. And God has challenged your heart by his Holy Spirit. And still today you sit on sea. Unmoved. Remember Lot's wife. And then we see another remember in God's word. And it's found in the Old Testament in Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 1. Not only a solemn reflection we see here, remember Lot's wife, but we see a timely reminder here. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. I wonder how many of us remember Sunday school days. Going along to Sunday school, singing the choruses. Maybe doing our worksheets or colouring in. Learning our memory verses. Learning the catechism and so on. We remember our children's meetings. We remember the choruses that we sang. Love, love, L-O-V-E. Maybe um, other courses that we remember that we have sang down through the years. We remember all of those. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. That's why it's so important that as young people, we listen to the voice of God. That's why it's so important to reach young people with the message of the gospel. To sow that seed of the gospel in their young hearts. The Roman Catholic Church says, give me a child until it's seven and it will never leave the faith. And that's why I believe it's important that we go to places and take the gospel. And go to children and reach them with the gospel. That's why we're going to Lanzarote in the morning. To reach boys and girls in Lanzarote that have never ever heard the gospel before. To sow the seed of the word of God in their hearts. It's so important. Because the entrance of God's word brings light. And we know that that seed sown, as Psalm 126 tells us, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth weeping, bearing precious seed, the word of God, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing. How many of us remember things, uh, Bible lessons, how remember, we remember uh, verses because we learnt them as children. Think of who made us, who created us. The God who created all things and as we've shared in other messages that the catechism says man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. I was brought up in a church where I didn't hear the gospel. I was brought up in a church where I was told that if I came along to church and I brought a Bible with me and read my Bible sometimes and prayed sometimes when things got tough and give my money into the church that that was enough to get to heaven. But that's not what the word of God says. The word of God tells us that all of these good works, although they're good in themselves, are not good enough. Why did the Lord Jesus Christ have to come? Why did he have to go all the way to the cross and suffer the pain and agony of Calvary for us if we are good enough ourselves to get to heaven? He paid the debt that we could never pay. He paid the price that we could never pay. All of our good works and all of our religious living are nothing in themselves. They're just filthy rags in God's sight. And that's why it's so important that we come. And as a child growing up, that's what I was told. But I was brought along to the Baptist church in Rathfriland by my great uncle and aunt. And I loved to go. 
I loved the singing. I, I loved the preaching. And sometimes we used to bang the pulpit and scare the life out of you. But I'm so glad that the seed of the gospel was sown in my heart. I'm so glad for people like the Sunday school superintendent and his wife who prayed for me for years. I used to go along to the Sunday school prize giving once a year. I didn't go to the Sunday school, but I went to the prize giving every year because you got lots of nice sandwiches and cakes and buns and all the rest of it. But the Sunday school superintendent's wife always had a little prize for me. And that's something I will never forget. I went along to the little brethren children's meetings. Someone in the car came around. There might have been 10 of us in the back of the car. You wouldn't, of course, be allowed to do that now. But then taken off to the children's meeting. And there the seed of the gospel was planted in my young heart. I didn't understand it. And growing up in teenage years, we had to move house because my father, uh, uh, he was a policeman. And we had to get out of where we were living in, uh, originally in uh, Crosswood Lane. And then we had to move to uh, Newry and then get out of it and move somewhere else into Banbridge. And we went to a church again that didn't preach the gospel. But a mission came to the Baptist church there. And I was invited to go along to that mission. And I went along. I loved it. The singing was the same as what it was like in Rathfryland. The preaching was like that. And for many years, God spoke to my heart growing up as a teenager and telling me that I needed to get saved. And I used to think, I'll wait until I'm 40, because 40 is really old, isn't it? Don't think that anymore. I used to think, I'll wait until I'm 40, and I'll have done all the things I want to do in life, and someday when it suits me, I'll give God the rest of my life. But then my uncle and cousin were killed in a car accident. One was 33, one was 22. And I very quickly realized that life doesn't go on forever. Two men that were out in the fields that day, working hard in the hay fields on the farm. On that evening, we're in eternity. Just a few hours later. Not only the old day, but every day we see the brevity of life, don't we? There was a young man who lived not very far from here. A young man who got a new motorbike, very fast motorbike. He was showing it to someone that we know, a friend of ours, and telling them about how fast the bike would go and everything else. And, and just a few days before that, he was standing in a pub. He lifted his pint glass up on the air and he said, my motto in life is to live fast and die young. Live fast and die young. That young man had everything going for him. He had a wife, he'd got a family, he'd got a booming business. And our friend that day began to witness to him and telling him, you know, you need the Lord. The young man laughed at him. He said, oh, I have plenty of time for that. He got on his motorbike. He was going down the road and there used to be a level crossing, a train crossing on the road. And there were no barriers in those days, 30 plus years ago. He didn't see the train because the sunlight blinded him as he was coming, flying on his bike down the road, his motorbike. On that afternoon, he went into the tree and, and into eternity. Live fast and die young. That was his motto. The word of God reminds us, what should it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? That's why the word of God tells us, remember now, not tomorrow, not next week, not next year, not when it suits me. Remember now thy creator, because the word of God says that now is the accepted time. Behold, now today is the day of salvation. Karen and I sometimes sing a song, and I'm going to quote the words of it to you. It says, I get up, it's a testimony of a young man. I trust it's not your testimony tonight. It says, I got up on Sunday morning, went to the church at 10. I listened to the words I heard time and time again. The preacher spoke of sinful lives. It seemed that he spoke of mine. But I thought I'd get plenty of time. Plenty of time to decide where I'm bound, to eternal darkness or to a heavenly crown. I'm just a young man, not yet in my prime. So I'll just wait. I've got plenty of time. The second verse says, I walked on down life's pathway, Living as I wish to live, I to please the other fellow, beat the other fellow, I to see what life could give. Making money is not sinful, having fun it's not a crime. So I'll just wait, I've got plenty of time. 
before I knew what had happened. Earth's scenes had passed away and millions stood before God's throne for it was judgment day. Now eternal darkness beckons and the name God calls is mine. But I thought I'd got plenty of time. Plenty of time to decide where I'm bound to eternal darkness or to a heavenly crown. I'm just a young man not yet in my prime. So I'll just wait. I've got plenty of time. The last chorus says this. Eternity waits. I've got plenty of time. To think of all the days that Christ could have been mine. But my chance is over. Earth scenes are left behind. And here I am. I've got plenty of time. In a lost eternity. Having wasted my time. Friend wouldn't it be sad tonight. To think that someone. Listening to this message. God has given you opportunity. God has given you time. To get right with him. And you've put it aside. Maybe you think some other day. Or some other place. Or some other time. But not today. A timely reminder. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. A solemn reflection, remember God's wife. A timely reminder, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. And then we see a third remember in God's word. And it's an eternal regret. We find that in Luke chapter 16 and verse 25. Luke chapter 16, the Lord Jesus is speaking to those who were turning up their nose at him. And as he spoke to them, he he reminded them of two men. Two men at the extreme opposite levels of the social ladder. One man owned everything. But the other man had nothing. One man was clothed in purple and fine linen and furred sumptuously every day. Now the Lord Jesus wasn't saying it was a sin to be rich. He wasn't saying it was a sin to wear fine clothes. He wasn't saying it was sinful to have a well furnished table. But putting those things before God it was sinful. Putting those things before their soul was sinful. As we've already shared that verse. uh, What should it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what would a man give in exchange for his soul? This man had everything in life. The other man had nothing. He lay at the entranceway, the doorway into the rich man's home. He was covered in sores. All he wanted was the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Now the commentators tell us that back in Bible times they wouldn't have had napkins like we have today. But they, rich people would have wiped their hands on pieces of bread and thrown the bread out to the dogs. And after the dogs had had their fill, the poor man, that's what he had, the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. That's all he had to sustain life with. It tells us that The dogs added to his affliction because they came and they they licked his sores. This man had nothing in life. Lazarus had everything prepared for eternity. Two opposite extreme levels of the social ladder. One had everything. One had nothing. But then life's great leveler came. Because it reminds us there in Luke chapter 16... That death came. Death came to Lazarus the poor man. It's no surprise this is whenever we read of his condition. No surprise. The death came. And it tells us that he was taken by the angels to Abraham's bosom to everlasting life. But then it tells us that the rich man died doesn't tell us anything about the poor man being buried but I'm sure he was he'd have been buried in the potter's field but then it tells us the rich man died and was buried can you imagine the costly spices can you imagine the elaborate funeral and only if the people could have seen him in eternity how they would have found out realized That having his riches and having all the things that he had in life was not enough. It tells us there in Luke chapter 16 that the rich man lifted up his eyes in torment in that place called hell. 
It tells us that he cried out for mercy. What did he say? Lazarus, just dip the tip of your finger in water and come and cool my thirst. He didn't want his riches. He didn't want his friends. He didn't want his elaborate living. He didn't want his costly clothes or his well-furnished table, did he? All he wanted was just a, a drop of water. That's all. Just a drop of water because he was tormented in the flame. Friends, that place called hell is real. It's a place where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. It's a place of everlasting punishment. It's real. The Lord Jesus spoke and warned more about that place called hell than he spoke about heaven. And that's why the answer came back to Lazarus, as it, or to, to the rich man, as he cried out for mercy. He was told, Son, remember. Son, remember. Look back over your life. Look back over all the opportunities that you had of trusting God, turning away from your sin. Look at all those opportunities that Lazarus took, the, the poor man lying at your gate that told you about God. But you turned your back on God. Reflect on those things. Uh, folks, I, I believe one of the worst things about being on a lost eternity in that place called hell is a memory. Because you'll remember every meeting you've been to. You'll remember every time that God spoke to your heart. You'll remember every time that you strive, the Spirit of God strive with you as you walked out the doors of the church, as you disobeyed the voice of God. All those opportunities of getting right with God, all those opportunities of getting saved and living for God, you'll remember every single one of them and they'll torment you forever and ever and ever and ever. Son, remember. You see, the rich man, he thought of eternal issues, but it was too late. The rich man prayed for his family, but it was too late. Send someone to my father's house, lest they also come to this place of torment. It was too late. He was concerned for their salvation. But it was too late. If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded that one rose from the grave, he was told. A solemn reflection. Would it be sad to think that someone listening to this message tonight, someone who knows the way of salvation, someone who's had opportunity over the years to get right with God, that someday you'll look back in eternity. You see, death comes to every single one of us, doesn't it? Death comes suddenly. Death can come unannounced and uninvited into our homes. The word of God says it's appointed unto man once to die. And after that, the judgment. Death is something that we can't avoid unless the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. Each one of us are born to die. And if death comes today as it could to any of us, none of us know that. None of us know if we'll see tonight. None of us know if we'll see tomorrow. Not one of us. The Bible reminds us that our life is like a vapor that appears for a little while and then it vanishes away. It's so important that we're ready, that we're prepared for that wonderful place called heaven by trusting in Christ. A solemn reflection, remember Lot's wife. A timely reminder, remember now thy creator of the days of thy youth. An eternal regret, son, remember. But then we see our final remember. And we've read about it here in, Gen in Luke chapter 23 again this evening. Where the thief on the cross cries out, Lord, remember me. Again, in past messages, we've shared about the triumphant entry into Jerusalem. The wonderful ministry that the Lord Jesus Christ had. We shared about the four unjust trials that Jesus had. We, we shared about the Garden of Gethsemane and how he cried out, Not my will, but thy will be done. Nevertheless, let this cup pass from me. We shared about how that Jesus stood in Pilate's judgment hall. 
how that he was numbered with the transgressors. As Barabbas stood beside him and the crowd cried out, crucify Jesus, release Barabbas, release the rogue, crucify the Son of God. All part of God's plan and purpose for you and me. And how he carried that cross up the hillside of Calvary. How that he was nailed to the cross. But there were two thieves, it tells us here, we've read together in this passage of scripture. Two malefactors that were hanged who reeled on him or mocked him. One mocked him and said, if you're really who you say you are, if you're really the Christ, if you've really got a kingdom, then get off the cross and save yourself and save us too. He only mocked him. The other said, Lord, remember me. If you really have a kingdom, if you've saved others, if you've changed their lives, then you can meet my greatest need as I hang on this cross, salvation from sin. Those two men both had opportunity. Those two men had the privilege of hearing the Lord Jesus cry, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. They had the privilege of reading the superscription above him. This is Jesus, King of the Jews. Someone said the first gospel text that was ever written. They had the privilege of hanging beside the Lord Jesus Christ. They had equal access. They had equal opportunity. But one walked and one repented. Lord, remember me. Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, save me. And Jesus confirmed to him, didn't he, as we read here, the Lord Jesus said to him, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. What a wonderful Savior we have. What a wonderful Savior who's not a dead Savior, not just one who went to the cross and died in the cross for the sin of the world, but one who rose again the third day and one who lives today. The Bible tells us the one who ever lives to make intercession for us. He knows every single one of us today. He knows our needs. He knows our burdens. He knows our concerns. He knows our heartaches. He knows our problems. But he knows our hearts today. He knows whether we have trusted in him or rejected him. Or not even rejected him, but neglected him. There are many people, I believe, who don't reject salvation. But they neglect it. Some other time, some other place, some other day, some other mission, when it suits me. But they find themselves in eternity and it's too late. There's no going back. There's no second chance. There's no second opportunity. Folks, it's forever and ever and ever. For eternity. Jesus confirmed to him today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. Today, what promptitude? There was no purgatory. There was no waiting. Instantaneous. Today, thou shalt be with me. What a person. To be with the Lord Jesus Christ for all of eternity. In paradise, what a plea. That wonderful place called heaven. Where there's no more sickness or sorrow. Where there's no more pain. Where there's no more death. Where there's no more separation. Where there's no more sin. To be with Christ forever. What a wonderful place to be. With such a wonderful person. For all of eternity. As we worship the one. Who loved us and gave his life for us. A number of years ago, my father had one brother, and he wasn't married. He lived with my grandmother, way down in Fermanagh. And whenever we were down with my grandmother, we'd often share about the things of God. They were good church people. We'd share about the things of God with her, but my uncle would always stop us and say, No, I don't want that talk in this house. And because it was his house, we had to respect it and he'd put us out. 
Karen and I were home from working with the Faith Mission across the water. We brought the boys down to see my grandmother. And we, she, was, she died when she was 96. And uh, just before that, uh, about a year before that, we were down with her. And uh, we were praying that in some way my uncle would leave or go to the shop or go somewhere that we would get opportunity of talking with her. And so we did that. He actually asked us to stay a wee minute or two that we could, he could go down to the shop and get a paper or whatever. And we had opportunity of sharing with her the gospel. And she said, I'm a good person. I'm religious. I, I believe the Bible, but that's enough. 95 years of age. She died the year later. But then my uncle, just about a year after that, or two years after that, took ill, and he came up to stay with my mum and dad up in County Down. And uh, again, we had the opportunity of sharing the gospel there with him. My mum and dad were saved and been able to talk to him about the things of God. And well, we, he couldn't put us out and he couldn't stop us talking. Uh, he maybe argued with us sometimes, but an opportunity of sharing the gospel with him. He took on well one Monday morning. And on the Wednesday morning, my mum rang me and she said, get over here quickly, he's very ill. I think he's dying. We went over and the hospice nurse was in with him. He, was, he had cancer and the hospice nurse was there and she was a believer, her husband was a minister. And she said, do you mind if I talk to him about the things of God? I said, you talk away. We have tried to talk to him, please talk to him. And as she sat beside him in the bed and held his hand as he was dying, she quoted verses of scripture to him and she talked to him about the things of God and told him that he needed to be saved. He didn't like what he was hearing. He didn't want to hear the gospel. We watched him taking his final breaths that day and he didn't have a very pleasant death. And we watched him going into eternity. And folks, it broke our hearts to think that God had given him an opportunity right to the very final breath of hearing the word of God. And I trust even in the final seconds of his life that he cried out to the Lord for salvation. I don't know that. But I trust that he took time to do that. And I could tell you story after story after story like that. Last summer, John Weir, an evangelist, came to do a mission at my grandparents' farm. Many of my family went to the farm. They're not believers. They have no interest in the gospel. They're more interested in Orangeism and loyalism loyalist, loyal, and bands and everything else that goes along with that, sadly. But one of my cousins, I asked John to visit him. And he went to visit him. His wife didn't allow him in the house because of COVID. But John told me that he talked to her for about three quarters of an hour outside, sharing the things of Christ. The mission was extended for a week. We prayed he would come to the mission. And just across the fields, he could hear the mission if he stood at the back of his house. He couldn't come to the mission, but he went to the band parade on the Friday night. He went to the last Saturday parade on the Saturday but by Thursday, he was in eternity. And I've often thought of that and thought about the opportunity that he had of that three weeks of mission. Not everybody gets that. He had the opportunity of the evangelist knocking on his door and sharing the gospel and giving him literature. He had the opportunity of all of that. At his funeral, his brother, who's a believer, stood up in the pulpit to give a tribute and he looked at the coffin down below him and he said, I trust, brother, that you took a wee moment to turn from your sin and trust in Christ. He said, for him now it's too late. But for you who are listening, many of the family who are in the church, there was about 300 people standing outside who couldn't get into the church. He said, for you who are listening, God has given you one more opportunity today. Maybe your last. A memory is a wonderful thing. A solemn reflection, remember Lot's wife. A, a timely reminder, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. An eternal regret, some remember. A genuine repentance, Lord. Remember me. I wonder, will you look back in eternity? 
And will you be glad because you trusted in Christ in that wonderful place called heaven forever? I trust that you'll not be like the young man we shared about in that song earlier on. That eternity waits, I've got plenty of time. To think of all the days that Christ could have been mine. My chance is over, earth scenes are left behind. Here I am, I have plenty of time. In a lost eternity, having wasted my time. Folks, that, well, that's why this church is here. That's why these folk are here. If they can help you or I can help you in any way, you get in touch with us. We don't need to be too glad to take you to the scriptures and show you what Christ can do for you and how you can come to know him for yourself before it's forever too late. Remember. Father, we thank you that your word is truth. And Lord, we thank you for the solemnity of your word even today. And Lord, we just pray, Lord, that you will touch hearts, that Lord, you will speak to all of our hearts. And help us, Lord, to see that life at best is very brief, like the falling of a leaf, like the binding of a sheath, but that we need to be in time. And Lord, we pray if there should be someone listening to this video, this message, we pray, Lord, that you will open their hearts and help them, Lord, to see that now is the accepted time, that now today is the day of salvation. Pray you'll bless your word, that you will use it for your honor and for your glory, because we ask it in Jesus' name.